I run the um, I run the computational psycholinguistics laboratory here uh, in BCS, and um, computational psycholinguistics is sits at the intersection of three fields: um, computer science, in particular artificial intelligence, psychology, and linguistics. And so, that's a perfect combination for the sub part of this department that I'm in, the cognitive science, the cognitive area. So this is very much cognitive science, which is an intrinsically interdisciplinary endeavor. And um, I, to, I'm giving you sort of a nutshell summary, but I also want to give a couple of really specific instances of um, the kind of research that we do as well. So I'm going to start from the high level and give you a broad overview. And then what I want to do is try to flexibly dive into a few different things as case studies. And you can interrupt me and ask questions and so forth just should be totally flexible and you know um, if you have questions also I can talk about sort of like my career trajectory as well um, and I can sort of intersperse that with all these different things and I can give you sort of like some you know stories about oh how did this project go how did it work out and so forth um, actually before um, I start into the details I, let me tell you a little bit about my personal background um, as well because it's uh, you know, people take different trajectories in uh, in their academic careers, and uh, uh, some people take very, it's very direct that you know exactly what you want to do from early on. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks so much. Sometimes the, the trajectory is very direct, and sometimes it's not. So um, in my case, I, um, so I actually did my, uh, I, I'm, I grew up in Arizona, in Tucson. Um, and I grew up in a household, I, I was very lucky, um, from the point of view of somebody who was going to go into academia, I grew up in an academic household, which offers a lot of advantages. It, it also, I think, you know, your, um, the context of your upbringing also creates, in a sense, um, sort of like, it can also constrain the imagination. So for example, so I, do, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona in mathematics, like a number of you are studying mathematics. Um, and I sort of decided, you know, late on, I, I, I spent a lot of time just having fun and doing math and learning lots of things. And near the end of undergrad, you know, the, the question is, what do you do next? And um, I was also very lucky that there was, there was a, at the University of Arizona, it's a very large public university. So we don't get the kind of personalized advice, I mean, when I moved here, this is the first time that, two and a half years ago, this is the first time that I've been a, uh, a faculty member at a, uh, at a private university. Um, and uh, I was stunned that every undergraduate has their own advisor, for example. You know, at the University of Arizona, not everybody, not every undergraduate has their own advisor. I was at UC San Diego before moving here, and not everybody had their own advisor. So anyway, um, but I was very fortunate that at the University of Arizona, I was in a, there was an honors college and I was part of that. And so I did get to have the opportunities to get a little bit more personalization of guidance um, from faculty who were sort of specializing in, like they, part of their job was to work with honors college students. And I remember one of the main honors college advisors asked me, so what are you gonna do afterwards? I was, I, and I said, well, I'll probably go to grad school. Uh, that's not, and, and you know, the response was, wow, you know, it really requires a lot of um, dedication and perseverance uh, to commit to wanting to go to grad school. And I said, well, in my case, it's probably more a lack of imagination because that always seemed like an inevitable sort of available thing. I, and that's not obviously not available and inevitable and sort of it, it's as, as accessible seeming a thing as it is for, you know, people who grew up in my environment. And so one thing I'm very glad about, I think, you know, um, programs like this and more broadly, we should be moving toward uh, a society in which that's seen as something that's accessible to everyone. Um, at any rate, uh, I, uh, I then um, was working in math and I got very interested in evolutionary biology. Um, there's a lot of wonderful evolutionary biology you can do with genetics and, and many of you are working on genes and um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole field of population genetics. It's a wonderful field, super interesting theoretical questions, super interesting practical things you can do. Um, but then I um, very serendipitously wound up studying abroad. You know, so many people study abroad uh, during their undergraduate career. And I very serendipitously went to uh, uh, Singapore for a year. And in Singapore, I started studying Mandarin. Um, and I completely fell in love with 
learning Mandarin. And my classmates were largely Japanese um, because this was a time when the Japanese economy was not doing very well. And so it was a very popular thing to do in Japan to, once you finish your college degree, since it's harder to get a job than it used to be, you could go abroad for a year. If you go to Singapore, A, it's a pretty similar, like it's also a, a sort of very industrialized country, so very easy to adapt to. Everybody speaks English, and then if you're learning Mandarin, you're learning two languages at once. So lots of Japanese classmates. So I completely fell in love with learning Mandarin. I also got very interested in Japanese and just sort of more generally that activated an interest in the differences in language, the differences in cultures around the world. And I spent a couple of years um, between undergraduate and graduate school um, uh, living in East Asia and studying languages intensively. So I now know Mandarin fluently and I know Japanese. My Japanese is very rusty, but uh, I was quite fluent uh, by the time I left. And um, that was an amazing experience, but also it sort of transformed my intellectual interests, um, which I was already interested in uh, the distribution, like variations across space and time in organisms. But I got extremely interested in human variation uh, and in space and time, and in particular the role of culture and language. And that was, that was incredibly eye-opening to me. So that really transformed my life. And I then, um, I decided to start a PhD program instead of in evolutionary biology, which I probably would have done otherwise. Um, I decided, I thought, you know, if I do that and I want to work on language and culture, people are going to ask you, what are you doing wasting your time on these things when you should be working on biology? You know? um, and so I decided to start a PhD program in anthropology instead, where I thought I could merge my interest in evolution and language and culture, and it seemed like it all worked out together well. So I started a PhD program at Stanford, and um, when I got there, I had never taken a class on language besides like language study classes. I had never taken a linguistics course. I had never taken a course on the cognitive science of language or on artificial intelligence of language. None. But I thought, when I got to grad school, I thought I should probably learn a little bit. And so I took a couple of courses in the linguistics department, and it just so happened, and I did not know this when I decided to go to Stanford, it was very serendipitous again, that Stanford was one of the top programs in linguistics in the world, like MIT is uh, in linguistics, one of the top linguistics programs in the world. So I was very fortunate, I sort of got this like immediate entry just really fortuitously. And I started studying linguistics and I loved it because I thought, wow, this is, you know, I was interested, so, so language, so, Humans are, we're a unique species, you know, um, in a lot of different ways. Um, language, of course, is a massively prominent signature unique thing that we have. Um, but more generally, humans are, we are, um, maybe some of you have read the book, The Symbolic Species by Ter Terence Deacon. So we are symbolic organisms. We generate symbolic thought. So our internal mental lives are symbolic. Largely, maybe not exclusively. We also have like non-symbolic mental imagery and so forth. But symbolic thought is a very important part. Reasoning, um, uh, sort of creation, creation of content. Those are all symbolic activities. And we also externalize our. We all externalize symbolic content, and that ranges from uh, gestures, which many there are cross-cultural differences in gestures, of course, in terms of the meanings of various gestures. And that shows that those they have some kind of symbolic like content. Also, for example, just think about the nonverbal street sign repertoire. Just we so there's symbolic content or the representations of, you know, uh, like if you think about religious ceremonies, all of these things invoke symbolic content. This is a cent this is central cent symbolic mental activity, both internal and external, is central to what we are as a species, and. This is very different from what we see in any other species, really, where there may be tiny vestiges, vestigial, well, vestig vestigial is the wrong word because that sounds like leftover, like sort of embryonic form of such type of activity, but it's, it, it doesn't dominate our lives, the, dominate life the, uh, for any other organism the way it does for us. And in my view, language is the, is, is, because of this confluence of what it is to be human and the fact that also, of course, we are the in terms of our ability to reason in sophisticated ways about the world, we can engage in intelligent activity. We don't always engage in intelligent activity, but we have the a capacity for intelligent activity, both as individuals and as groups. That is really very different, and in some ways superior, but 
not necessarily and always superior to other organisms. And so it th that, that, that the characteristics of our minds are very important to understand. Um, and language to me seems like a uniquely powerful window to investigate that because it is the most ubiquitous form of our externalized symbolic activity. It's the most measurable. It's the most recordable. We have it in abundance in our daily life, in our environment. And it's different. It's not universal. There are differences in the forms of languages. So it's also something that's both unique to us, but also in very important characteristics it's learned. And so to me, language is just an absolutely wonderful place to be, both because I love language and because I think it's actually a great inroad to studying cognitive science, studying the human mind. And of course, as a consequence of studying the human mind, gaining into insight into minds more generally, both the minds of other organisms and the space of possible minds, minds that may evolve in the future through biological change, or perhaps more likely at this point due to the relative speeds of change of different types of processes that we may invent or cause the conditions for the natural emergence of other kinds of intelligence in the form of artificial intelligence or all, there's all sorts of things, right? So there's, you know, enhancement of human intelligence through, through um, uh, all sorts of technologies. There's also the emergence of artificial intelligence. So that's sort of the backdrop to how I got here. You know, so I finished my PhD. I changed from my PhD from anthropology to linguistics. So I got a master's degree in anthropology. I changed then to linguistics. I studied linguistics. Um, and then I, I learned about artificial intelligence and uh, experimental psychology in the context of doing a PhD in linguistics. And as a faculty member, I brought all those things together. And that's what I try to do. So, um, so anyway, foundational architecture of human language comprehension, production, and acquisition. So I could describe my, um, my research is dedicated to the following problem. So one is, how do humans use natural language to communicate with such extraordinary flexibility? So every day you hear hundreds or thousands of sentences that you've never heard before. And they occur in a variety of novel contexts. And although sometimes occasionally you may be a little uncertain as to what somebody meant, by and large, you successfully understand what you hear and read. Not only do you do that, you produce sentences to express what you mean, and the people that you talk to or write to, by and large, understand what you mean. And that's despite the fact that actually there are all sorts of reasons to think why this just should not be possible. It should be too hard. Um, and just to give you examples of that, so for example, language is ambiguous. So here's an example sentence, very, very simple example. The women discussed the dogs on the beach. So let's take a poll. So first of all, let's start, start for a moment. This is an ambiguous sentence. Do people see how it's ambiguous? How is it ambiguous? Who's on the beach, right? That's, it's probably ambiguous in other ways, but it's definitely ambiguous in who's on the beach. So maybe the women are on the beach discussing the dogs, or the women are not necessarily on the beach, and they're discussing the dogs, and the dogs are on the beach. Now, it could be, of course, that both the women and the dogs are on the beach. And that's actually distinct from the question of the ambiguity of the sentence. So the ambiguity in the sentence is an ambiguity in what the speaker is committing to, right? So there's a version of interpretation of the sentence in which the speaker is committing to the women being on the beach. And there's a version of the sentence in which, interpretation of the sentence in which the, w the speaker is committing to the dogs being on the beach. But there's actually, I think if you think about it for a moment, there's no version of the sentence where the speaker is committing to both. So, you know, if we take that for a moment. Hopefully that seems intuitively right. Now let's take a poll. Who, which, which sound, what do you think the speaker is likely to mean? So raise your hand if you think the speaker means that it's the dogs that are on the beach. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, so it's about six. So we have a, so linguistic theory, which is a combination of the empirical study of language with a branch of mathematics which sort of grew out of work here at MIT in the mid 20th century um, that was actually pioneered by Noam Chomsky, um, has given us the means to mathematically describe this distinction. Okay, so this first 
interpretation here, oh, excuse me, this bottom interpretation here is the one where the dogs are on the beach. And the way you can see that is that I have trees sort of hanging on top of or resting beneath the word string. And in one of the trees, in the green tree, there is a node of the tree that the dogs on the beach is entirely inside and nothing else is inside. And that says that the dogs on the beach is a constituent. It's a, it's a uni unit, it's a syntactically coherent meaning bearing unit. And if you do a fuller semantic analysis combined with the syntax, it turns out that that corresponds to the meaning where it's the dogs that are on the beach. So, and now raise your hand if you had the other interpretation is the women that are on the beach is what the speaker meant. Is that, am I getting this right in terms of which, I already, the first one I asked about was the dogs, right? Okay, and so about equal numbers think it, so this is actually a pretty balanced sentence. It is, a, and people recognize the ambiguity, right? So this is the interpretation where it's the dogs that are on the beach, or sorry, it's the women that are on the beach. That interpretation arises from, notice that that interpretation is not just, it, it's not just that the women are like are on the beach now, but it's actually they were on the beach at the time of discussing the dogs, okay? And so you can actually see that, and I won't go into full detail, but this analysis implicitly represents that by the fact that on the beach and discussed are sisters in this level of the tree, whereas they're not in this level of the tree. So facts like that, a wide variety of facts like that are representable formally in a way that is predictive about what sentences are possible and what sentences are interpretable in what way. So for example, what are impossible sentences in a language? So for example, dog the barked is not a sentence of English, right? Now there are languages in which you could take the words dog, the definite determiner, something like that, and barked, and you could put them in the, that order and it would be an okay sentence of English. But one property of English grammar, and this is a, I'm now not a normative, people should talk this way. This is a descriptive, people do talk this way. And people do have intuitions about this. So this is not a, you know, this is not a normative endeavor. Um, it's a descriptive endeavor. But there are, descriptively speaking, there are variations across languages in word order. So word order, the constraints on word order are an important part of the grammar of a language. And the, the rule, the, to describe a fragment of language, we would write down a set of rules that would say what's, that these structures are okay, but then it wouldn't, wouldn't allow you to generate other structures. And that actually constitutes a predictive a powerful, predictably powerful hypothesis about the structure of a language. One reason why you might expect that communication doesn't work so well in language is that language is so ambiguous. And so that ambiguity could get in the way. Well, how can you guarantee if like one half of the people in the room might have thought, might have used this sentence to mean that it's the women who are on the beach, but some people on the other half of the room might have misunderstood it. It's no, 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 it's the dogs on the beach. That's an opportunity for misunderstanding. And I'm just giving you one example, but there's, most sentences are many ways ambiguous. And so how is it the case that we're able to converge on like the right agreed upon meaning when a sentence might, when sentences could have so many meanings? Here's another reason why sentences might be, where, why language might be difficult to understand, environmental noise. So we very rarely speak to each other in a soundproof booth where one person is absolutely silent while the other person is speaking. A lot of language and communication looks much more like this. A party where people are talking to each other and there are multiple voices going on, there's other environmental noise. Even in the present situation, there's some environmental noise going on. And so we don't get perfect. We, in fact, even figuring out what words are being said is an inferential problem. We have to infer what words are being said from the ambiguous Spoken language, the acoustic input for spoken languages, or the, the, the signed input, the manual input for signed languages. And actually, even just figuring out what the words are is a inferential problem. So for example, here is a, um, here's a famous example in the speech recognition literature. Uh, it's not easy to recognize speech. So what did I say? <laughs> Want me to say it again? It's not easy to recognize speech. Somebody raise their hand and say what they thought they heard. Yeah. It's not easy to recognize speech. Who thought they heard that? It's not easy to recognize speech. Anybody heard anything else? Yeah. Uh huh. Actually, what I said, it's not easy to wreck a nice speech. 
<laughs> but that sounds very similar, and that's a much less plausible thing to say, especially in the context. And so that's a demonstration that actually even just understanding what words are being said is an inferential problem. And that, th that might go wrong. It's yet another way that language understanding could go wrong. Here's a third, memory limitations. So let me give you an example. So lang language, as, as you, I'm sure you all are aware, you can only hold so many things and operate them on, on them at once in your memory. Okay? And when you try to hold too many things at once, it can cause you to make improper calculations, make mistakes, forget things, etc. Let me give you an example of how that works in language. So I'll give you a sentence and see what you think. Um, this is a very, another very famous sentence in study of language. The dog that the cat that the rat chased, killed, ate the malt. <laughs> Raise your hand if that was like, of course, no problem. It's pretty hard. I'll just say it again. The dog that the rat that the cat chased, killed, ate the malt. Okay, I'm, let me make it easier for you. Let me rearrange the words. It's the same meaning. The dog that was chased by the rat that was killed by the cat ate the malt. Sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's why yeah, yeah, I should have. It should be. I, sorry, I got it wrong. The first sentence, let me change it around. The rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt. That's better. Still hard, right? The rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt. Easy now, right? No, still. Sorry, sorry. The, the cat, the rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt. Is that easier? No, it's still hard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a speed problem; it's a memory problem. So let me reorganize the sentence. The rat that was chased by the cat that was killed by the dog ate the malt. Better, right? Okay, they actually mean the same thing. And just to demonstrate that, so once again, it was that the rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt. The rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt. The rat, the cat that the dog chased. Fine, right? The rat that the cat killed. Fine, right? So the rat that the cat that the dog chased killed. Fine. You see, there's two patterns. I'm just sticking them together. But it's it's hard. Because you have to remember all those nouns at the beginning, dog, uh, cat, da rat, cat, and dog, and then associate them with the right verbs in order. Whereas you just have to hold them all at once and then discharge them one by one as you associate them with nouns. Whereas if I turn it around and I say, the rat that was killed by the cat that was chased by the dog ate the malt, you get to uh, do those associations one by one. And it's still not that easy, but it's vastly easier, right? And you sort of feel like you have some hope of understanding what's being talked about. Once again, those two sentences basically mean the same thing. It's just active versus passive voice. In that context, it completely changes the ease of understanding. In the general case, of course, that's in a totally you're focused on the one sentence. But actually, I'm sure in most situations, you're doing other things at the same time as you're doing language understanding. You're also trying to you know, recall, you know, keep in mind you know, somebody's phone number that they told you or where, you, you're, where you're walking to. There are all sorts of other things you're doing at the same time. And so, um, your memory resources that are relevant for all sorts of cognitive activity are actually implicated in language processing. And overload of that is entirely possible. So that's another reason why language understanding may fail. And finally, incomplete knowledge of one's interlocutors. So it's actually th this, and by, by, what I, by, by what I mean by that is that you don't know everything about me, and I don't know everything about you. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Every aspect of your knowledge, mental state, intentions, beliefs, and so forth, goals. In fact, this is a necessary condition for it to be even meaningful to talk about communication. Because if you knew everything about me, including all of my plans, beliefs, goals, and knowledge, then you could predict everything I would say and I might as well not say it. So communicate, in fact, I could not provide you any information by saying it because you would already know. So in fact, it's actually this discrepancy in knowledge states, uh, incompleteness of knowledge about each other that makes communication meaningful. 
But it also creates a challenge. If we have no overlap in, in knowledge, then for example, you don't know when I use the word cat what it means, right? So there are conventionalized features of language that are that make it necessary to that are that are relevant for um, uh, for understanding. But there's also contextual features, right? So, for example, in um, you need to th take into account the fact. So, for example, um, if I say uh, you know the projector looks like it's getting hot. You, in order to figure out what I'm referring to by the projector, you will take into account the fact that we're in the same room and that we can see the same things in our visual field and so forth. And so that, that partial shared knowledge is going to help you interpret what I mean in context. And so the less complete our knowledge is of each other, the more opportunity there is for misunderstanding. You know, so for example, if I if I refer to the the third student to join my lab since I moved to MIT, you probably don't know who I'm talking about, because that's a case where I have knowledge of the domain and you don't, and that place is a con and of course, but I don't know exactly. Maybe one of you does know who that is, so I'm not sure, but I can make a guess. So we have to, and this uncertainty about what knowledge we share and what knowledge we don't share both governs what's worth talking about, but also it it governs whether we're able to understand what each other means. So these are the central questions about how do we actually succeed so well at this use of language for communication in the face of all these challenges. And the other half of this is how do we acquire the knowledge that allows this communication to be possible? That is, how do we go from knowing nothing, knowing no words, knowing, not knowing the order of, uh, uh, order of syntactic constructions, not knowing these things about, lang about the particular language environment that we're in, to knowing it. Do we start off at zero? We probably start off at a lot more than zero. Well, the more than zero that we start off with is that we have human minds. We don't have, you know, MacBook minds or rat minds or paramecium minds and so forth. We have human minds. And that's a massive starting point, but there's still a lot to learn in any particular setting. And languages change over time. So it's not even the case that there's sort of a fixed inventory of languages around the world and it's just guess which language you're in. It's actually construct the language out of the infinitely possible set, infer what the language as a whole is out of the infinitely, po infinitely sized set of possible languages. So this is what I work on. and. Um, I work on it by trying to bring together a number of key things. Um, so I talked to you about the mathematical descriptions of language structure, which I studied. I was absolutely energized by when I first encountered them in Stanford, and I continue to use them today. So there are these, there's this rich, and, and uh, uh, there's a uh, linguistics, linguistics departments in particular, the very a uh, highly active area of research in linguistics departments called generative linguistics, generative grammar, um, gives us mathematically precise descriptions of language knowledge that predict what forms will be possible in a given language, which, what meanings they might have. And those, each mathematical description itself is a scientific hypothesis about a language that's being studied. And there are people in linguistics departments around the country and around the world developing these, this theory, both to explain individual languages, so there's a lot of work, for example, on English, but, they're, but also trying to study all the languages around the world. Um, the vast majority of languages have been studied far less than they should be. There are, does anybody know like, about how many languages there are in the world? So there's, to just take a guess for a moment. It's about, sorry? So yeah, yeah, there's six to 7,000 languages in the world. Um, and the vast majority of them have been studied far too little and we know far too little about them. And they hold, they are the repository of knowledge information for us as scientists and as members of our species in order to understand what, what the w variety of ways it is possible to be human includes. Um, and so there are people around the world who are engaging in developing this theory, both to describe specific languages and to understand also what kinds of linguistic structures we do and don't see around the world. Because there's some kinds of things we never see. There are some kinds of things we see rarely. 
There are some kinds of things we occasionally see, but if we see that, we have to see something else as well in the language. So there's an inter-intensive, rich, articulated structure of, of possibilities that we're still in the process of understanding. And that plays a central role in my work. I also combine that with computational models. So these are models from that, that, uh, that are draw upon tools from artificial intelligence, machine learning, statistics, computer science more broadly, to try to build explicit hypotheses that are both fittable to data and interpretable as cognitive theories. I combine that with psychological experimentation, where we design experiments, usually behavior experiments, although I'm start, just starting, I'm very excited to start to do experiments that use brain measurements. In particular, for example, the uh, using EEG or MEG to look at the rapid real-time development of the, the brain response moment by moment as we hear or read language. But most of the work is behavioral. So for example, I'll bring people into the lab and uh, set them up in an eye tracker. So this is an infrared camera that's recording eye movements. And then I'll give them a text and we'll record the rich, rapid set of eye movements that they make as they're reading the text. And we extract information from that. So for example, we have a project in my lab that's ongoing where that demonstrates that, for example, if you're a non-native speaker, the eye movements that you make reading English carry information about what your native language is, and they also carry information about your proficiency in English. So we can actually, for example, we're about two-thirds of the way to the quality of a TOEFL exam in figuring out how good you are at English if you're a non-native speaker just by looking at your eye movements and reading. And then, so, but more generally, uh, things like your eye movement patterns or also in a visual context, if I'm looking at a display and I'm hearing somebody speak, what I look at and its relationship to what I'm hearing, all those things carry a rich amount of information, a huge amount of information about how language processing is unfolding in real time. So psychological experimentation plays a major role in my work. And finally, language data sets. So we are, in, in, I mean, this is a really amazing, unique era. So um, who's used the Google Books data set before? Does anybody know about the Google Books data set? I'll show you guys in a moment. Okay, that'll be on our agenda for the rest of the time. Um, this is an amazing and fun data set. It includes something like 5 to 15 percent of all the books that have ever been published. And they're all scanned and you can search them. You can't get, for most books, you can't have, because of copyright, you can't get the full texts. But what you can do is you can look at multi-word strings and how, fa how common they are and how they rise and fall in frequency and when new words appear and so forth. And we try to pull all these things together and we do, we draw on all these things in our lab to understand this foundational architecture of human language comprehension process, uh, production and acquisition. So just a couple of very brief examples. Um, what this might look like is um, we might use a grammatical description from theoretical linguistics and we might annotate, we might add on, we might make it probabilistic. So we put probabilities on different pieces of language structure because some constructions are really rare. So for example, like, you know, if I say like, an excited poodle pranced into the room versus into the room pranced an excited poodle. Which one of those seem, is, does one of those seem a little more surprising than the other? The second? It's true, that, that, that was what I did is I swapped the positions of the subject and the locative phrase, the into the room phrase. And even in that case, I actually set that up to be one of the most invertible examples, but even in that case, it's a pretty surprising thing. So we might say that, that inverted word order is a low probability word order. And those probabilities will help us disambiguate. It helps us with the disambiguation problem, both figuring out what were the words that are likely to have been said. So for example, a priori, you're more, you expect to hear recognize speech as a word sequence versus rec a nice beach. And because of that prior expectation difference, that pushes you toward one interpretation even though what I said was different. It was acoustically similar to recognize speech, but it was different. So that's one thing we do. Um, here's another example that we can think about. So here's a, here's a kind of sentence that we study a lot in my group. The woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. 
So is that a weird sentence? It's not the first weird sentence I've given you, but, and it won't be the last. So what are, share for a moment your experiences about, introspect for a moment about your experiences reading and hearing that sentence. What was weird or hard about it? Where did it happen? Yeah. The woman who brought the sandwich from the kitchen trips. Very good. Who, who, raise your hand if that seems right to you. Those like, yeah, good. Any others? Any, any other intuitions? They're different from that? Yeah. Could you say the woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen and tripped? Yes, very, very good. Anybody else have that intuition? The woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen and tripped? Yeah. But now, okay, so that's great. So that, those, are your, those are your intuitions about globally what's wrong with the sentence. Now, does anybody have any localizable, temporally localizable intuitions about when did something seem to start to be off about the sentence? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it the, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. That's right. So the difficulty is that the word tripped, right? So this word tripped basically is like this does not fit in, right? That's the experience that you have. And that's true. So we can actually record that. If we eye measure your eye movements during reading, what'll, what we'll see is we'll see signs of disruption at this word tripped. You might move your eye, you'll slow down, you might move your eyes backward. Well, there's actually nothing wrong with this sentence. This is a perfectly legitimate sentence of English. Just like the rat that the cat that the dog chased killed ate the malt is also a perfectly legitimate sense, sentence of English. Those are legitimate from the grammatical principles of English, but they're hard and, uh, for, and they're, they're hard for actually importantly different reasons. So the first sentence example that I gave you, the rat cat dog example, is hard because of memory overload. This is hard for a different reason. And to explain that, I want to point out that what this sentence should mean and should be equivalent to is the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Is that okay for people? Anybody have a hard time with that sentence now? The woman who was? The woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen. So somebody brought the woman a sandwich from the kitchen. And we're talking about that woman. And that woman tripped. A little weird. Especially since you'd be thinking about another interpretation of that sentence. So who got that interpretation on first reading? Nobody, right? Oh, you did? No, no, no. After oh. first reading, I'm adding the who was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the first reading of the sentence without the who was, who got the same re meaning as when I add the who was? OK. Some people may still be a little skeptical that this sentence can mean something like what I just described. But I'm actually going to change it one more time. Now, I want to substitute. Let's just substitute the word brought with the word given. The woman who was given the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Anybody have a problem with that? Any ambiguity about what that means? The woman's getting the sandwich, right? Okay, the woman who was given the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. So we're all on board that that is okay, right? Okay, now let's take that sentence and let's take the who was away from it. The woman given the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Is that okay? It's okay, right? Anybody, raise your hand if you don't like that. It's a little surprising maybe, but it's like, it's okay, right? Meaning wise. The woman given the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Okay. So what I've just demonstrated to you is that in this kind of case, where somebody's, the, where this is a pass, so given is a passive form, right? So the woman was given the sandwich. The woman who was given the sandwich. The woman given the sandwich. In that situation, I can drop the words who was. Okay. So now let's go back to the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. Likewise, notice that brought. So brought unlike, so bring unlike give has the property that the past tense form and the, the passive participle form are the same. So I brought, I was brought versus I gave, I was given, right? So this, the woman who was brought, this brought form is a passive form. And as I said before, there's a rule in English that says in that situation where you have this relative clause structure, that's what it's called, that begins with who was, and then it continues as a passive. You can just drop the words who was. 
And so the woman brought the sandwich from the kitchen. It's perfectly fine. But it's, what's confusing about it is that there's another much more appealing way to look at that part of the sentence, which is that the woman's doing the bringing, not getting brought the sandwich. And that's actually from a sentence, from a structure probability perspective, it's a much higher probability thing to happen. For the same reason that into the room pranced a excited poodle is an unusual structure, just an unusual structure. But figuring out what the sentences are, that's a, what the sentence structure is, that's an inferential problem. So what's happening is that up to this point, there's a very strong plausible inference that is actually turns out to be the wrong inference about the sentence structure. And we can model that formally. So here's a model from a paper that I did, which what I'm doing is I'm showing you the analysis of this sentence in syntactic terms unfolding word by word, starting with the woman, and now I'm going to just add some words some at a time. And uh, the sizes of these trees are basically the probabilities given the available information, conditioning on structural frequencies and so forth, of each of the interpretations. And so from the beginning, and, and so the top analysis is going to be the one where the woman's doing the bringing. The bottom one is the one where the woman's getting brought the sandwich. And so it starts off already favoring the bringing, the, the woman doing the bringing, even though the word hasn't arrived yet. So in fact, actually, this model predicts that if I get a verb nicked, it's probably going to be a verb that the subject is the, is th that the first noun is the agent of, the, the one doing. And so it actually is a predictive model in that sense. And it continues on. And the additional information brought the sandwich makes you even more confident about that. And from the kitchen, even more confident about that. And you can see this is like a very, very marginal dispreferred interpretation. But actually, this is the interpretation that's required. This interpretation allows you to accommodate trip. The woman who, it's his, and this is the same structure, just without a few of the words, as the woman who was brought the sandwich from the kitchen tripped. This structure has no way of accommodating that word. And so we can use these models to account for and actually make predictions about the kinds of difficulty patterns that people will have in interpreting language in real time, both in reading and in speech. We can also couple this with, and we do things like these kinds of controlled experiments where we look carefully and deviously construct sentences so as to fool the reader or the listener. But we also look at broad coverage. So we look at like when you're reading natural text. And we do things like ask, well, you remember that predictive component I was talking about? It turns out that we're actually doing prediction all the time in language. And I, I'll give you an example of this. So I'm going to give you the beginning of a sentence. And you will find, this is not something you have to do, that it's quite likely that a word will just pop into your head as the next word in the sentence. So I just want you to hold on to that word and think about it. And I will try to guess it on the basis of experimental data that I've collected in the past. Okay. So here's the first example. Um, uh, my brother came inside to. Everybody got a word? OK, so I will try to guess it. These are the kinds of things people guess. Um, chat? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah? Good. But anybody else have chat? Well, OK, I'm better than zero, but only one. Uh, get warm? Probably not this time of year. Um, wash? OK, let me try it another, with another example. The children went outside to. Now you're all laughing. And just think about for a moment, you're all laughing. But what does the fact that you're laughing tell you about, your, about cognitive state and about theory of mind? So A, you're much more confident than you were before about what the next word was. B, you have introspective. So you, you guessed a particular word, but you actually have introspective awareness of your confidence level. And even beyond that, you have awareness or belief, which is confirmed by external events, like people giggling around the room which suggests that you actually expect that everybody else will have the same expectations that you do as to how the word continue, as to how the sentence continues. So that's actually really, so we've actually just in one sentence example, we've indicated prediction in language, varying degrees of confidence, and actually like sort of theor a theory of, not only a theory of an individual mind of an individual person, but a theory of a distribution of types of minds around the room. Okay, so all those things are just encapsulated in that. So the, ne the word was play. Now. Raise your hand if you thought of the word play in the first example. My brother came inside too. Anybody think of play? Yeah, a couple of people. Usually a couple of people think of play. So notice that, and there's nothing weird about the word play in that context, right? So there's not that high probability of a word. So play is a much lower probability word in the first context than in the second context. But the, um, 
but it's a perfectly reasonable, plausible word. There's nothing anomalous about it in either case. So prediction and probability cannot be reduced entirely to some kind of like a plausibility or lack of anomaly. Now it turns out empirically that when a word is predictable, not even just a word, and when, in a, when a, any kind of grammatical thing, any kind of language thing is predictable at a particular moment, you actually, your behavioral and neural responses are measurably different. So we can detect distinctive neural signature responses to a predictable word versus an unpredictable word. And in behavior, there are also differences. In particular, when you're reading, you're more likely to skip a word that you can predict already. And if you don't skip it, you're more likely to read it quickly. That is, you're using prediction in a sense to like optimize your reading, okay? to not spend time on stuff you don't need to spend on because you, don't, you already know what it'll be likely to be. And so we can do things like use large-scale statistical analysis with models of language that approximate those predictions from large linguistic data sets using computational models to try to understand the relationship, the quantitative relationship between how predictable a word is in context and how much longer you'll spend reading it than you would otherwise. And it turns out that that actually has a very law-like relationship. So this is two different methods that we use empirically of studying reading. One, this is one where you just sort of press a button over and over again to reveal words sequentially. And this is one where it's just, we're tracking your eye movements and it's naturalistic reading. And what I want you to get out of this is that on the x-axis is log probabilities. Okay, so these are basically like bits. It's just a different base. Well, it's base 10, but they're basically, think of this as bits. So it's an information theoretic quantity. How probable, how log probable, how many bits of information did the next word give you above and beyond what you could already expect about the next word, about the sentence? And then the y-axis is the contribution of the word's probability above and beyond a bunch of other factors that affect reading times. The contribution of that word's probability to the total amount of time spent reading that word and slow down in the immediate vicinity. And what, the thing you should get out of this is that these, these curves are straight lines, basically. That means that basically the way, pro, the way prediction and processing load work is that an interpretation of this is that like words are information theoretically interpretable th pieces of information that come to you. So a word presents you with a certain number of bits of information. That presents you with a certain amount of work that you have to do to incorporate it into your representation of the language understanding of, the, of what you're reading. You spend that much time, you, you budget that much time in your reading, and then you continue to read. <coughs> so it's actually a very, so there's, it turns out that there's a straightforward information theoretic characterization of how language processing and, um, uh, and prediction work. And we can even do things like, <coughs> embed these kinds of models in a reinforcement learning environment. So we have an agent that like moves its eyes to try to optimally gather information about the text. And it turns out that we can then predict, we can, well, we, in fact, we can derive from, from simple principles of optimal action in an uncertain environment, patterns of eye movement behavior that are, that are signature patterns in humans um, and are reflected automatically in our model just by sort of building this all up together. Um, okay, so uh, uh, that was a fairly detailed example. Uh, Mandana, how, how long are we going again? Uh, we have one 15, but it can be extended by both. Okay, I guess I want to like, I want to stop now. And I just want to ask people if they have questions about anything or like there are particular things that they like to hear about. I can talk about other things too, but I want to give you a chance to give feedback. Yeah. Um, I think about the, the woman brought the from the Yeah, trip, yeah. Like so yeah. like there is no grammar in that sentence, time and period, but when we're given like a kind of guarded path sentence, yeah. um, could one hypothesize that if there were a comma after the woman and then a comma after kitchen to kind of segment that off, specifying yeah. something about the woman, would that really change predictability? So that's a great question. So, and that actually, there's a whole other part of my research program in modeling real-time language understanding that you're sort of connecting to, which is that, um, so the kinds of models that I described basically say, like the problem specification is, I get a sequence of words. I know what those words are. And I have to figure out what the, the grammatical structure is that underlies those words in order to interpret the sentence. But as you know from the recognized speech example, that's an oversimplification. In fact, you don't know 
what the word, you don't have veridical access to the word string that you're trying to understand. That itself is inferential. The problem of figuring out the words is inferential. And we can now ask like, well, we can, uh, we can imagine that there are some different kinds of architectural designs for how the language processing system might be organized. So it might make sense to sort of like have two modules, like a get the words from acoustic input module and then a analyze the words once you've got them module. But actually, this level has a lot of information about what the words are. Okay. And you can see that, in fact, your reactions to this sentence exemplify that. Because the anomaly, I mean, once again, it's a perfectly well-formed sentence, but in a sense, the surprisingness of the word tripped, given the context, was enough to make you all think of ways your response was like, it wasn't that, uh, you know, well, that was hard, but I got it. It was like, I think something's missing. And you can think of that, that itself as an inferential problem and a, a process. And it's like, it's a, that's, um, it falls into the category of what's often called noisy channel inference. So the idea is we're not going to treat the word string as veridical. We're going to treat the word string as sort of a, a set of evidence around which our beliefs about what the actual word string was should be probably centered. Okay. And so what that means is that if you can find a word string that is a much has a much more natural high probability high prior probability analysis and interpretation than the actual word string, then you might come to believe maybe it should have been that string instead. And what how could it have been another string instead? So it might be that I misremembered some of the previous words that I read. It might be that the speaker made a mistake. If you're thinking about a child learning language, that might be a situation where the child says, maybe my thoughts about how the grammar works are wrong. So there are all sorts of degrees of freedom that can be pushed around in this kind of noisy channel inferential problem. And, and so we actually do a lot of that kind of noisy channel modeling where we, and in fact, I think that that is going on all the time. And one thing you'll notice is that if you actually go and look at transcribed speech, it's much more errorful than anybody ever remembers. And so my view is that Th th is that the kinds of effects like, oh, the word should have been there, 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 that you have reading sentences like this are a consequence of an error correction mechanism that is always happening in comprehension. And that is part of the story of robust language processing. That's part of the solution to how do people do this so well, is that we have these error correction mechanisms. But they can lead it, they actually, when we get something weird that's carefully designed, it can force a hypothesized error to pop out even when it's not actually necessary by the grammar of the language. So that's great. Yeah. Um, so if you do a study in, in, like in one language, what, like, what requirements are there for the study like, to generalize it to other languages? Or if you do a study in one language, can you really only conclude things about that, like, people who speak that language? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really deep and uh, uh, far-reaching question. And it, it sort of goes to the heart of a bunch of major, like, sort of theoretical issues in the field. So um, and there's a lot of things to say about that. So one is that, um, one is that uh, of course, we all start off as, a, as essentially the same when we're infants, regardless of what language or context we're exposed to. So you can take an infant from anywhere in the world and put them anywhere else in the world. And as long as they're taken care of and spoken around, then they will learn the language in their environment. And so there's no, you know, there's no sort of genetic variability. I mean, there are some disorders that are genetic disorders that affect language, but setting that aside, and they affect all languages, not just one particular language. But there's no sort of genetic predetermination or predisposition to certain languages over others, um, as far as we know. There may be some, there are some very sort of corner cases which are, people are, have hypotheses about, but to a first order approximation, there's no variability that way. But there's massive variability, of course, in the actual languages. Now, if we go one step further, a natural hypothesis, so that's about the, lang the possible language structures that can be learned. All, langu all humans have the potentiality to learn all languages. But there's a slightly different question, which is like, what about the relationship between the language structure and the architecture of understanding, the understanding mechanisms? And um, of course, once again, from a, 
from an ontogenetic point of view, you know, um, we all have the capacity to become proficient understanders of any language. But that's a different question than like, is the gross architecture of language understanding desc describable in common terms for different languages? So let me give an example of where some people have proposed that it might be really different. So in languages, verbs, there's a lot of action that involves verbs. And what I mean by that, of course, verbs describe actions, but actually what I really mean is that verbs have a lot of syntactic content to them. Different verbs like to have, some verbs don't want objects, some do. Some verbs want multiple objects, like the word give, like give somebody a book. Many verbs don't. There's all sorts of other things to say about verbs. Some introduce complement clauses, like I think that. You can't say, like, I break that. Like, you know, I think that it's raining. You can't say, I broke that it's raining. Um, so verbs have a lot of stuff going on there. That means that when you encounter a verb, in some sense, it gives you access to a rich range of information sources about what else you haven't seen in the sentence yet. But language is very, very dramatically in where in the sentence verbs occur. So the most common word order is actually for the verb to occur at the end of the sentence. The second most common order is for the verb to occur in the middle of the sentence like it does in English. And then a non-trivial number of languages, but a minority, maybe 15% of languages in the world, have verbs at the beginning of the sentence. For example, Irish is an example of that. Arabic, classical Arabic is an example of that. Um, one might imagine that languages with verbs in different places have very different processing architectures. Alternatively, one might imagine, no, the processing architecture is, easily, is actually best described as highly uniform across all the languages of the world. And what we need to do from a theory development point of view and from a computational instantiation point of view is to sort of work out, here is what the architecture of language processing looks like for any language, sans anything that we say about the particulars of the language. And then if we can figure out what that's like, and we can say, give me a grammatical description for any language. I can plug it into that architecture and out will pop a set of predictions about how understanding unfolds in real time. So that's the space of possible hypotheses. I tend to think that the latter, the, there is a universal architecture of language, uh, of language processing, is, and, that, and that then that interfaces with the, um, you know, basically like the, uh, the particularities of language. That's probably... Like, my bets are on that. But it's really open in a lot of ways. And just to give you an example of the kinds of challenges for that kind of proposal, um, a language with verbs at the end. So German is an example of this that's been studied a lot. German has verbs at the end. And famously, and Mark Twain wrote about this, you know, it's like it's painful to read a long German sentence because you're just having to remember all that stuff in memory. You get everything in the sentence except what happened because the verb is at the end. And you have to remember all that stuff and then finally integrate it with a verb at the very end. Um, but that actually, it turns out empirically, the German speakers are actually better at some of these, the dog, the cat, the rat, or the cat, the, 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 cat, the dog examples. German speakers are actually better at those examples than English speakers. And maybe it has to do with the fact that they have more practice in maintaining those relationships. So should we think about that as, a language dependent architecture for understanding? Or should we think about that as an architecture where there's some memory itself is shaped? There's a universal way to describe the way memory works in language processing. But the memory, the structure of memory is then shaped in a contingent way by the structure of the language and the kinds of experiences the language user has. And so actually, we're working on a kind of theory like that um, these days. That's one. Uh, in fact, the, the relationship between these kind of probabilistic effects and these kind of memory effects, in my view, is one of the major frontiers uh, for our field. Yeah, a great question. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question uh, referring to the eye tracking. Yeah. The yeah. In the paragraph, I'm not sure if all the sentences have that type of like certain level of ambiguity. Um, hmm. um, yeah. Them. But I also wanted to know: Have you also seen different things, um, like? Um, because you mentioned that you can detect by the, the pattern of their gaze if they're like fluid or non-fluid. Right, yeah. They focus on certain words. But other than like the particular words you would like them to start to focus on, have you seen like words that involve emotion or harm or something like that make people stop and go back? Or That's a good question. So I haven't worked on that myself, but I, I have a couple of data points about that. So. <laughs> 
One interesting, I have a former colleague who works on, um, he's done work on like reading of politically oriented language. And um, so like he has, he has like self-identified Democrats and self-identified Republicans read like sort of stereotypically liberal leaning versus stereotypically conservative leaning passages of argumentation. And so what do you think, what do you think my colleague finds? What kind of pattern do you think? It, it's like an yeah, experiment, it's factorially designed. So sometimes the, you, you're randomly assigned, like you come in as, you, let's say you're a, you're a self-identified Republican, you're randomly assigned to read either liberal-leaning passages or conservative-leaning passages. So, so the result, the result, the first order description of the result is that basically people spend less time reading stuff that they disagree with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they just speak, skip over it. That's, that's a, yeah, so there's that, that's a little related to stuff you're asking about. Um, emotionally charged language I haven't ever worked on. Um, but there's one other thing I wanted to mention, which is, um, oh, uh, I'm forgetting now, sorry, yeah, yeah. But people are interested in those questions, yeah. Like also, um, Another thing that happens when you read is your pupil changes size. And when you're surprised or like just sort of very generally arousal will generally lead to enlargement of the pupil. So that's something that people might look at. But I'm not sure if people look at in the particular. Yeah. There's another question over here. Yeah, Joey. Yeah, I think you mentioned that um, for like uh, measuring like how predictive the next word and sentence will be, that eye tracking gives you a measurement that also matches with like neural correlates. Yeah. If that's the case, then what kind of questions are like MEG and EEG? Yeah, 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 that's a great question. Why ever use neural measures? So there are different views about that. So um, uh, uh, there are, are several different things that studying the brain, in la language in the brain rather than studying language and behavior can give you potentially. Um, so one, of course, is, uh, is spatial localization. So the, the thing to start with, conceptually the thing to start with is that Behavior is a very low dimensional signal when we're looking at something like reading, say, or even just like where you're looking on a screen as you're listening to a text. So reading tells you it may just be as low dimensional as how long did you spend on each word, but it might be something richer, which is like, well, you get something like, in fact, you get a data set which looks like this for each sentence. So this is actually a very high dimensional rich signal, but there's a lot of randomness in what people do. Even in just like, even given what you want your eyes to do, the motor, con the motor command is noisy. And so there's a lot of randomness in this whole thing. Um, and so really we use a very low dimensional reduction of it traditionally to analyze it. We're sort of interested in what can we pull out of this beyond that low dimensional reduction. But you only get a few dimensions, like for example, how long, like how likely are you to skip the word altogether without looking at it? If you look at it, how long do you spend reading it the first time you look at it? how likely are you to move your eyes backward rather than forward after you look at it for the first time? It's sort of like three, th those three things plus a couple of other things. There's a few other things, but it's a low dimensional signal. Studying, scanning the brain is an insanely high dimensional signal, right? It's, it gives you many, many dimensions. As many dimensions as you have electrodes, if you're doing an EEG or MEG and with fMRI, you get as many dimensions as you have voxels. And that's in each time slice. So it's a very different kind of data. And the thinking is that, um, so there are two advantages, potentially. So one is spatial localization. You can ideally figure out where in the brain things are happening, not just with behavior. You can see what's easy and what's hard, what people are tending to at a particular time. You can get spatial localization. You can also sort of get temporal localization about what's going on internally, not just about when people respond behaviorally. And that temporal, temporal that's with thin time, fast time slices with EEG and MEG. But, and, and uh, so th those where and when questions can be important, but there's another thing that you can use the high dimensionality of the data for, which is to try to figure out which phenomena, which language processing phenomena are more like each other and more unlike each other. Under the logic that if a brain responds in a grossly similar way to two different things, maybe it's treating them in similar ways. And those are, once again, those are plausible inferences. We don't know with logical certainty, but that can be very useful. So for example, 
broadly speaking, um, EEG data in particular, in the past almost 40 years now, there's been a long history of research on EEG responses in sentence processing. And one major result out of that is that the brain, in, in general terms, distinguishes as distinct patterns of response to encountering a semantic anomaly to a grammatical anomaly. So if you read, um, you know, um, uh, you know, Julie and Sarah walks to the store, that gives you a very different pattern of anomaly relative to walk to the store than I like my coffee with sugar and sock gives relative to sugar and milk. So those are things that you can use neural methods for. It depends on what we're doing, but uh, in a lot of cases, yeah, we, 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 we ask questions in a lot of our studies for a couple of reasons. One is it's actually just to maintain attentiveness um, so that people can't just zone out because then, so in fact, actually, here's another cool thing you can do with eye tracking is that you can actually tell when people's minds are wandering. It's so like you have, you have the experience of like your mind wandering while you're reading something boring. So that's detectable. So you can do that. And, uh, but in general, we don't want to assume too much about the eye movement signal. Like we want to sort of, the ideal situation is when we're doing experiment, people are attentive all the time, unless we're in particular interested in, in attentiveness. Have you seen a difference between people that are like just reading um, versus people that are reading because they are expecting a question? Yes, the yeah, you know, so um, uh, the, in terms of the work that I've been involved in, the clearest example of that is probably we have people read in different ways and we see how it affects their eye movement. So for example, we ask people to proofread versus regular read. And there are different kinds of proofreading. So there's proofreading of like looking for typos that create words that, like just non-words. But then there's also proofreading for typos that a spell checker couldn't catch. The, all three, normal reading and those two kinds of proofreading, all three of those things elicit different eye movement behavior. Yeah. But sometimes, of course, we're also interested in the relationship between people's eye movements and what they did and didn't figure out about the sentence. And so we can actually, we're particularly interested in those cases in looking at the relationship between the eye movements and the question answering behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a great question. So the answer is yes. Um, so we definitely know that. Uh, I think the more proficient you become in an, there, there's sort of two parts of that. There's one sort of like, one part of that is like just overall, like how good are you, like are, are you close, are you at the level where you can comfortably read the text at the difficulty that you're reading? There's that, okay. So that we can definitely, we get signal on that and um, you actually, you, sig signature effects from your native language do show up. So for example, um, languages vary in whether they have determiners, also called articles, like a uh and the. English has them, um, uh, Western European languages generally have them, Eastern European languages don't, East Asian languages generally don't. There's a lot of variation. Um, so uh, in languages that for, for nat native speakers of languages that don't have determiners, tend not to look much at determiners in English until they're quite proficient, which makes a lot of sense. Unless you've gained a high level of proficiency, you're not, uh, the, the meaning contribution of a versus the is quite subtle. And it's not like, you can't point to it. It's a contextual property. It's a, it's a property of the relationship between the thing that you're talking about and the broader context. It's a very subtle thing. And so it takes a while to master that and people seem to ignore it if you don't already have a high level command. So that's part of it, but there's another question. And let me do one last poll. So um, I'm gonna give you another ambiguity and I'm gonna get your intuitions about it. Um, okay, so I've, this, is, this is a real experiment. I don't know how this is gonna turn out. This will be interesting. Um, okay, let me give you a phrase. The daughter of the colonel who was on the balcony. That's ambiguous. 
who was on the balcony? So just think about which sounds more likely to be the case. Was the daughter on the balcony or the colonel on the balcony? So raise your hand if you think it was the daughter. Raise your hand if you think it was the colonel. Okay, now you know, most people thought it was the colonel. Raise your hand if you thought it was the daughter. Uh, are you, uh, so I know people vary a lot here in native language, so what are your native languages? Nepalese. Nepalese, oh, that's so cool. Oh, that's awesome. Arabic. Arabic? Arabic. English. English, okay. That didn't work very well. So it turns out, <laughs> at, okay, so it turns out that, now do we, ha do we have any native Spanish speakers here who are, okay, great. So what about like native uh, other Romance language speakers? Any other native Romance language speakers? So it turns out, let's do it. Now what I want you to do is if you, if you fluently speak another language in your head, just translate that sentence word for word into your native language. Just think about it. Now, now ask who's on the balcony in your native language. So raise your hand if it's the daughter. Did anybody switch when they did that? Nobody did, darn, okay. Because it turns out if you do this in Spanish with native Spanish speakers and English with native English speakers, you get different preferences. So in English, the preference is that it's the colonel who's on the balcony in Spanish and in actually many other languages, Russian, uh, German, Dutch, many languages that have been studied, it's the, uh, it's the daughter who is on the balcony. Now, there are some languages, and I don't know actually, what's, how do you say that in Nepalese? How do I say that? Um, yeah. Um, go to the balcony and and could, you, could, you could you provide us a word for word translation of that? Like, like, like is, the same, is the order the same I, as English? Um, no, I mean, I thought the daughter is in the balcony, so I said Colonel's daughter is in the balcony. Yeah, that's how I define yeah. too. It's like, but it, did you use a who is kind of concern or did you just say the daughter's colonel is on the balcony? Um, I said daughter of colonel is in the balcony. Oh, oh, I see. But yeah, yeah. So it was, but you were actually using a complete sentence. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, 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 yeah. Because the form that I used in English was, a, was not a complete sentence. It was just a noun phrase. So, well, we'd have to take this online and do a little more extensive, like writing out the, the examples in full. But there's real cross-linguistic variation in this. So in many languages, if I do that, the daughter of the colonel who was on the balcony, the, although in English, the preference tends to be that who was on the balcony is describing the second noun. In many languages, including actually most of the European languages that have been studied, the preference is the opposite. And there is, it has been hypothesized, although not borne out by our very informal sample, that actually that native language preference will actually influence your interpretive preference in English. So that's open, those are open research questions. Yeah. These are great questions. Great, well I expect you all to now join Cognitive Science of Language graduate programs. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, this has been a real pleasure, thanks. <laughs>